Steve, globalization, the panel is yours. Great, thank you. It's great to be with all of you, and I just want to say a special thanks to Slave Debsky and to PISM. This is my first time at this great conference, and I have been having fun. I hope all of you have been uh, as well. Um, we have a terrific panel, but let me just start for a moment. I had dinner with a few congressmen in the United States the other evening, and, and one of them, Representative Brendan Boyle, who represents a district uh, in Pennsylvania, said, I said, what do you, what do you, what's the worst thing you can talk to your constituents about? He says, globalization. He says, that word instantly turns everyone off. Uh, and it used to be such a happy word. It used to be, uh, it used to mean we were gonna get things from all over the world more cheaply. Uh, we were getting connected with other people and experiences, and it was a positive word. It was back in the time, you know, of Bill Clinton's presidency, I remember. I know this is not an American panel, but it's, but this is my framing. Globalization had this nature that it was sort of part of a higher trust world, that it was low fear, high trust, people, ideas, institutions, money, flowing more frictionlessly across borders. It was the time Thomas Friedman wrote his book uh, that, that we were gonna have a flatter and flatter world, that everyone was gonna look more like the United States. How wrong was he? Uh, and at that time, when you began to see other things happen, terrorism, but also borders began coming back. That wall, talks about walls came back. and. And of course, we've had now uh, this horrible uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. We've had, of course, a pandemic, where today we've got a very connected world, but I call it a high fear, low trust world. Uh, and in that dynamic, it's really going to impact the way we think about what our futures are and how we uh, approach them. And I just want to start out, we have, we're going to be very interactive here, hopefully, but I'm going to start out with Rafael and just say, Rafael, how did we get here? What were the determinants of I would say the down, at least the deterioration, if not the downfall of globalization. But but how did we get where we are by way of and 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 where where we're kind of wobbly at the moment uh, because of the inf effects of the pandemic? What have we realized? And as we see a classic kind of horrible war, real invasion, real people dying. It's not a war game. Um, what has that done to our notions of globalization and how we think about what an economy is for? As long as globalization uh, brought fruits, uh, and we experienced actually 20-25% of uninterrupted economic growth, everybody was happy. Uh, of course, we had crises, the Asian financial crisis, the internet crisis of 97, 98, 2001, global financial crisis 2008, but nevertheless, uh, uh, in the human history, there was no period of, of such, a, such a phenomenal growth. Poland actually, uh, together with Australia, if not, uh, not misleading, uh, experienced almost 30 years of interrupted economic growth, slightly smaller than, than South Korea. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a kind of a statistical outlier because uh, capitalistic economy is about booms and busts. Uh, so we move actually the growth in cycles. Uh, and because of globalization, uh, the cycles uh, flattened basically. Nowadays, when the, actually the whole world but, but is put that in real people speak, what does that mean in real terms? In real terms, meaning that we have a crisis and growth. Crisis and growth in macroeconomic policy is about managing those uh, periods. Uh, globalization or shifting, uh, shifting economic growth to other areas like Asia, China, of course, uh, uh, former Soviet Union countries, Central European countries managed to uh, provide, uh, uh, provide fuel for, for this uh, economic, uh, economic development and growth. And uh, of course it's over. It's over. So currently we have problems with inflation, and of course we can blame uh, Mr. Putin for that, but that's not the whole truth. Uh, we can have problem of indebtedness of developed economies, and it's a huge problem. Uh, together with rising interest, this is even a growing issue. So people start feeling that there's something wrong with this uh, globalization because they are worse off than better off. And I think that's one of the reasons. Not to mention that there were, of course, problems, underneath problems in, in developments, uh, uh, in transitions. So Russia is the best example because fundamentally Russia was uh, making mistakes from the very beginning of its transition, and I can come back to that later. So re it resulted in a, in a building of a, uh, of a uh, state that is uh, actually not fitting into the system, uh, which is being more and more aggressive, and the war is the result. So I may finish on that, we can come Wait, back. I want to jump to my case too, but I think one of the things I want to weave into this conversation, and hopefully uh, you can smarten me up on it, um, all of you, is 
the question of what drives power in the world today. Is it the size of a military, the deployment of military, or the failure to use military, uh, and, and, and the mistakes that Russians and others are making right now? Or is it the Belt and Road Initiative? Is it economic codependencies? It's the weight of innovation and uh, the way an economy works. And I think the United States, frankly, is struggling with that from an identity perspective. I think it wants to you know, believe that it's a global economic leader, but I think when it looks to China, China, you know, it, it fears that China may be getting both of these uh, right. And, and you know, I, I, I think it comes down to something really clear. If America falls back, if you have decoupling, and America pulls back from the kind of economic footprint that it once has, Europe is considering decoupling uh, from Asia as well. Mike, I know this is an area you thought a lot, particularly the Indo-Pacific. So I'd like you not just to reflect on the paradigm shift you see here, but what, it, what makes a state or nation powerful today? Is it, is it uh, does globalization help or hurt? <laughs> yes, well, thank you. That's a terribly difficult question. And obviously, military power will always play in. Um, but as economic power used to be sort of the big thing we would look at, I think now it's technological supremacy. And I think the, the fact that China was building that quite rapidly, you know, with great state support in many different ways, I think that's what freaked the, uh, the United States out. And that's what I think led to, to what I like to call the clash of capitalisms, mm. when we really see the, the differences in, in political and in economic systems and the way that they are connected played out, you know, in, in you know, indeed what you mentioned, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I would say, not the whole world turning to be out like uh, the United States or Europe. Right. So that's, that's a that's a huge shift, and and I think what we are seeing now is a, is a period where we're all coming to terms with what that means, that clash of capitalisms, because it's not just the capitalisms that clash, but it's also norms that underpin sort of that uh, th those systems, and it's the values as we discussed yesterday, what defines the West, um, and obviously also with technological supremacy comes the ability to set standards, and and also here we see China challenging uh, what the United States States and Europeans had built earlier what we were so comfortable to and what we took started taking for granted, frankly speaking. Mm. So that is, uh, I think, what, what first of all, this, uh, this conflict uh, mainly between China and the US and now uh, the EU also waking up to that and, and changing and adapting to it. That was the first thing. And then, of course, COVID amplified that. Um, it amplified the differences and it highlighted dependencies uh, that we were sort of comfortable still ignoring, although we saw that uh, clash of capitalisms. And, and now looking at uh, diversification, um, and of course, then we had uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine, which highlighted yet other uh, dividing lines between countries. We already spoke about how India features in there, uh, slightly, interestingly, of course. So that's, um, that's a major theme. And, and uh, the COVID and, and, and the war in Ukraine, I think, is interesting because it's highlighting also in different ways how digitalization, you know, which is an, uh, um, sort of a, a next step in, in, in technological uh, developments, um, how that plays in. Because COVID, of course, showed us, you know, the, the beauty of digitalization mm. and the digital domain that allowed us to f still function in this, in this world uh, where so much else was closed. Um, but then, of course, the war in Ukraine highlighted uh, the downsides, uh, the, the cybersecurity challenges and disinformation. So this is, I think, uh, really important issues for us to look at now. And, and I want to come back and I'll, I'll end with that opening remarks to what you said about globalization. Yeah, it's the, uh, you know, not the word that, that people used to like so much. Uh, sometimes I hear people talk about deglobalization, um, you know, which is also, I don't think, a good way of framing it. But in the EU, I think this is also partly why we are turning now to connectivity. It's a way of highlighting that we still want interconnections. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want dependencies. Uh, so we're looking at how to redo globalization with connectivity uh, and what is the good and the bad of that. And uh, Global Gateway as that big flagship project behind that in uh, you know, taking that to the world is, uh, is important here. And I like your concept of the clash of uh, capitalisms. Have, have, have Europe and the United States solved their own clash of capitalisms? No, not yet. Not no, yet. Yeah. I mean, it just raises an interesting question, just as by way, because you talk about, you know, the growth of tech, platforms, innovation, et cetera. A few years ago, some of you may have been at the Brussels Forum, and I interviewed the Minister for Single Digital Economy. Um, uh, at that time, I don't know if it's the same person now, but he was from Estonia. Very interesting, very high tech uh, uh, and very um, 
you know, he's very pro-American, but I said, hey, would you ever have a Twitter or a Google um, born in Europe someday? And he goes, no, no, you Americans innovate, we regulate. And, and it raised this interesting, he said it on the record, so I can do that, but it's an interesting perspective because it does raise the question whether we need to, within the transatlantic relationship, find different competencies. Maybe we're not good at, and we clearly aren't good at the kinds of regulatory schemes that we, because America is constantly screwing up on that front. But Europe gets it right most of the time and usually sets the standard in the world. Maybe that is the, you know, the, the transactional partnership that we need to have. What are your thoughts, Micah? Well, I think we all, because regulation is also about internal regulation, and I would like to do the United States to do a little bit better here and, and perhaps, you know, look at what we've achieved in, the, in, in Europe, um, just as many other countries throughout the world have done, by the way, you know, look at our data protection and how that inspired many others, right. uh, hopefully also in the United States later. Um, at the same time, Europe is looking at, wow, the, the American big tech, you know, we would like a share of that pie also. So we're investing in that heavily. Um, obviously, you know, we will always have each of our strengths. And, and I like the idea of, you know, coming to one sort of big grand bargain because the clash of capitalism between us is so much smaller, obviously, right. than the big clash that's really with authoritarian systems. Right. Well, thank you. Well, um, thank you. Now, Ileana, you know, you work at a great in in institute, the Elcano uh, Royal Institute, and I know you do um, annual studies there, and you've got a global presence index that you've worked on that's taken a look at some of the impacts of the pandemic and, uh, and the crises we're having around the world on people's aspirations and how they think about, I don't know, the social contract, if you will, on the globalization front. So tell us what you've learned. Yes, uh, thank you for, um, firstly, one, one, one quick word on, on uh, why we are not that happy on globalization anymore, yeah. which has to do with, with uh, the results of this index. I also think that that shared and maybe very high expectations on, on globalizations in previous decades were also based on the assumption that it was a very simple phenomenon and that it had to do with increasing trade flows, but actually it was a very complex phenomenon with, right. with many sides and also the technological side, the military side, um, the human side via tourism, migration, and uh, therefore the consequences were more difficult to forecast. And uh, at some point, this evolving phenomenon was going to throw mixed results for, for different groups and countries and, and groups of people. So uh, in that same line, well, wh what happened with the, what we observed through the results of our index is that with the pandemic, as, as with previ previous episodes, such as the, the Great Recession, some trends were deepened and uh, we, we, could we, we could also observe some new trends. So um, as for the, the, the first thing, the, the trends that deepened, well, maybe not deglobalization, I, I, I agree with you, but, but we are in some kind of post-globalization phase that didn't start with the pandemic, that started in the mid-2010s. Uh, and maybe this also had to do with that this is a phenomenon that couldn't grow and keep on growing and growing without a limit. So at some point, uh, the interlinks between different economies is, well, not at its maximum, but maybe at a very high level, and, and we cannot expect it to, to grow at least not at that pace. Uh, so in that sense, of course, the pandemic had a huge impact um, on global exchanges retrenched in, in, in all types of exchanges, of course, trade, mm. uh, not investment, but uh, in the military, and also in the soft realm, the, the, the tourism, migration. Of course, this has to do with the fact that, um, well, uh, human mobility was reduced and uh, lockdowns in, in, in the main economies. Uh, but, uh, and, and uh, to build on, on Micah's comment, um, technological and scientific exchanges skyrocketed uh, during the pandemic, uh, probably uh, having to do with, uh, with uh, the search for the vaccine. Uh, but this accelerated a trend that was also already happening before, f before the pandemic. And this is probably going to deepen the gap between those countries and those economies that are managing to 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 keep on innovating and uh, to to keep on achieving uh, scientific and technological advances, and those that don't. Um, and just one one last word on this is that um, 
this, this retrenchment of all the types of, of soft exchanges, such as uh, tourism, education, culture, migration, is, is actually a new thing. Those had been the drivers of globalization once the economic drivers stopped. And uh, this is something that has happened with the pandemic, and we still don't know if these are those exchanges and, are and, going and to And what be. about populism, though? You know, I think about the antithes antithesis of this kind of conversation is sort of, if we were to go to where my family's from in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and talk about globalization, they would not enjoy this conversation. There's a lot of, you know, populist, conservative uh, culture who they, they feel like they fought the Cold War, served the United States and the world, and China somehow ended up winning. And, and, and in that, I think, when we think about the other, the downsides of this set of people, it's been the rise of populism. So what do your studies show you about that? How do you, you know, do, it, do you see populism rising in reaction to, to, the, to the economy, or do we need to talk about decoupling and slowing down globalization or focusing on it to basically as an antidote for populism? Yes, um, I, I, I think there is a connection, and it has to do with, with what I mentioned uh, previously on, on, on depicting globalization, globalization as a very simple phenomenon with, with very clear consequences. And it's not like that. So, I mean, it's an easy topic to blame because <laughs> it's not a person, it's not a political party, it's not, so uh, y everything is uh, the, the fault of, of, of globalization. But actually, um, several of the reasons why um, uh, those, those um, I mean, the groups that feel uh, or that perceive themselves as the losers of globalization are actually the losers of, of a series of domestic policies and uh, um, misregulations, lack of regulations. And uh, of course, and the thing is that um, you, w w some economies can combine perfectly well some level of protectionism and uh, strate strategic autonomy and regulation and a very active role in the world. And actually, to some extent, and in some domains, China has very effectively managed to combine all those, all those different uh, objectives at the same time. Thank you. Well, Clemens, um, I'm fascinated by this world that we've moved from. You know, I tell people, we used, we used to live in a Toyota world. In Toyota, if anybody worked in Toyota, there was a term called Kaizen, and Kaizen meant continuous incremental improvement towards perfection. But it also, uh, in terms of production techniques, you had just-in-time production. And I once wrote a piece one time, I said we live in a just-in-time time, just in time world of just-in-time jobs, just-in-time money, just-in-time everything. And somehow that world has come into, um, we don't have just in time anything anymore. Uh, that that the supply chain crisis in the world is staggering. Uh, I'm trying to put a jacuzzi in at my house, and I've been told there's a 13-month wait. Uh, you know, for for the parts and things like this. What has happened, and what did we have now revealed about ourselves about depending on everything working so smoothly, so cleanly that now we're in a place where whether it's strategic materials or whether it's the supply chain or whether we're dependent on parts of the world and we don't like their values. What have we learned, Clemens, from the, uh, the, from the pan since the pandemic? Well, I think the availability of uh, everything at cheap prices was just one of the great strengths of globalization. We got used to that uh, until uh, it happened to be a great strength or until it didn't work anymore, and, and that was the, the pandemic. But I think this was just one... Uh, of several things that stopped working. I mean, globalization brought this promise uh, also, you know, made and totally in line with what economists think that, uh, you know, if others are better off, we are better off. Uh, and I think the first um, uh, difficulty that came up uh, and was felt was that uh, not exactly everybody was made off. You mentioned that uh, s some people in the U.S. and in, in other countries didn't benefit. Uh, I mean, there, there's this famous uh, elephant graph uh, describing that the middle classes in the West have lost um, uh, and uh, the people in the very poor countries have been left behind. And mm. then we, we have these emerging economies that have benefited and the top incomes. Uh, but then other disappointments came. We had the migration crisis. Then a lot of people, as you said, became aware that national sovereignty was limited through globalization. If we do a trade agreement, we cannot decide everything in our national parliaments. We have to give up some 
aspects of our national political sovereignty. That's, the, that's why the Brexiteers came up with this slogan, let's take back control. There was this impression that we, we're kind of losing control through globalization. And then the next shock came with the pandemic, as you said, when this, you know, this thing that used to work smoothly, very efficient supply chains stopped working. And it's really dramatic. We do sur corporate surveys and Germany is one of the countries where, where uh, corporations, where firms are extremely integrated into the world economy. Mm. Uh, and in the last 30 years, the, share, the maximum share of companies telling us they had supply chain problems was 20%. That was in 2011 after the financial crisis. It was 20% of the firms. Now it's 80% uh, of the manufacturing firms telling mm. us they have problems. So it's a massive problem. I mean, it's not, it doesn't mean globalization isn't efficient, but the supply chains have become very efficient and very vulnerable. And the pandemic was a unique event. It has messed up everything. It doesn't mean it won't work again in the future. Uh, but that was, was one of the shocks. And now on top of that, we have the war where we see that dependencies are suddenly a problem. Uh, these long supply mm -hmm. chains and, and dependencies on energy are suddenly a problem. Uh, we thought they wouldn't be a problem. So what's the, what's the response to it? I, I, I know most of you haven't read this book. I've uh, read a new book that's, that's, I think, just come out this week by Ian Bremmer, and it's called The Power of Crisis. And in this book, he makes, it, makes a basic argument. And for those of you who don't know, Ian Bremmer of the Eurasia Group is the guy who believes he's got the, the G0 world, that there's no longer a shaping, controlling, organizing force in the world, the world's become chaos. It's a very bleak perspective, um, but he's written a kind of optimistic book now, and he argues that the pandemic, climate change, and massive jumps forward in technology and what it can do to us in bad ways. So lethal autonomous systems, AI, you know, tech gone amok without, you know, good frames. That these will now force this chaotic world, G zero world, to actually increase cooperation. And I'm just wondering if he's naive, that, that will we try to look at what you just shared and said, you know, the systems come undone, will transatlantic relations or will we work with China, will we look with the great powers of the world and finally come back and have a resurgence in sensible governance and response, or are we just going to continue to retreat um, and become, you know, kind of do our own laundry again and kind of stop, uh, you know, see trade go down and, you know, decouple from that globalization vision. What do you think? Well, I, th I think companies, governments will try to, to achieve more resilient systems. I think what we have learned is that there are increasingly, we have crises, we have political crises, we have natural disasters, and what companies are now trying is, for instance, diversify their supply chains, uh, be and be and through that be more resilient. A lot of governments are talking about uh, reshoring production, bringing home production or nearshoring. Uh, I don't think this is making things more resilient, but diversification is. So I would say we will see a lot of diversification, um, parallel ca extra capacities, spare capacities will be built up. That's very costly, but I think that's where we're going. What was that? Rafael, your thoughts on that? If I may follow on that, because uh, <clears throat> there are also uh, economists used to say it depends, because this is a long-term process and uh, this is a rather a question of causes and consequences. Just two examples uh, grouped in the period of uh, 30 plus years. The collapse of the CMEA, I don't know if you remember what was that, uh, Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, so basically the clearing system for rubles in, uh, in, in, in communist states. It happened in 1991. And it was a blessing uh, for Poland and other Central European countries because it allowed Polish companies to restructure and uh, uh, shifting pattern of the trade towards the West before anybody thought about uh, uh, membership in the European Union. At the same time, uh, the ruble zone was functioning until the end of 1993. So basically all former Soviet Union countries lost two, three years in economic transition. And why was that? I can tell you because I was working already at that time uh, on site in, in those countries. Because Western countries, mostly US, were against uh, collapsing of the ruble zone for no reason unless political one to maintain the power of Russia. Uh, the result was that transition in those countries, including Ukraine, uh, uh, lost a couple of years and they were losing next years in, in next decade. Uh, finally, it resulted that uh, those economies are still very weak and Russia is relatively strong towards them. 
Another example, 30 years later, we have two processes in the European Union which, in my opinion, are very doubtful. Firstly, what happened, and we see consequences of that, the industrialization of, of European economies. Uh, industries shifted uh, uh, towards Asia for the reason, of course, of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the climate uh, regulations. Uh, and in Asia, you can ask questions, are they behaving uh, better and uh, emitting less uh, CO2? No, the opposite. And of course, and, and the consequences for Europe is that we lost millions of jobs in the industrial sector, uh, lots of uh, unemployment in blue-collar workers, capacity to build uh, military equipment, which is actually visible right now, because Europe is not able to, to quickly rebuild, like United States, for example, its, its military might. Uh, and other consequences and, and related to that is the climate uh, energy policy. Uh, if, I don't know if you are aware, but uh, in, in the program, which is now being discussed, Fit for 55, there's an <laughs> assumption that energy consumption in Europe should drop by 8% from economic perspective, is a nonsense. You can expect lower energy consumption with the higher GDP growth, which is actually happening right now in Poland, because the GDP dynamics is higher than the energy consumption, and it's called energy efficiency process. Or you can switch energy resources, but you cannot expect drop in energy consumption. Mm. Because in history, in the economic history of mankind, it usually ended up in the, in the, in the collapse of the empires. Either was if you w define the, uh, the, the, right. the, the energy source. Mm. So these are the consequences or the causes of the consequences that happens usually in the period of next 10, 20, 30 years, but this is about right. economy. Well, Mike and Ileana, I'd love to get your, your comments on this as well, but an another sort of tag on to this that I've been thinking about, if you look at the future of where the rising global middle class is, it's really not in the United States, it's not in Europe. And so one of the questions I don't think we're asking ourselves, if you end up seeing these economies decouple, say from a Chinese-led global economy, and you end up with a split in standards, a split in kind of, you know, there are now two mothership economies, you know, you have a, a, you know, a divided, bifurcated uh, global economy, doesn't China's footprint and relationships and networks um, outperform the Wests, because we're not growing in terms of growing global middle class, we are aging, uh, and they are growing and have you know the prospects of big growing economies. And what does that mean for us? Are we are we basically boxing ourselves off, Micah? Yeah, well, I mean it's clear that China is expanding and, and its presence and, and influence everywhere, and uh, <laughs> I think it's about time that we start responding to that also, rather than just looking at ourselves. Um, so uh, just. Before I answer your question further, I mean, uh, the point about decoupling, I, I frankly speaking, I, I don't think that is really happening. Right. I mean, we hear it mainly coming from the United States. I agree with uh, you. I just hear a lot of talk. But yes, yeah. well, that depends on where you are. I think yeah. you hear that more in the United States. Um, but even, you know, the United States is not decoupling full-fledged from China. I mean, COVID, yes, that is having implications probably, you know, a few years down the line on, on investment in China because of the delays and, and the uh, that, that is causing a difference, but it's not as if all American companies are leaving uh, China. Uh, we, we had last week, I think, from the American Chamber of Commerce, you know, clear uh, a, a report saying exactly that. So, so decoupling, I think, is, is almost a word that appeals, you know, to, to, to certain groups of people, and that's why it's used, you know, for, for populist uh, purposes, you could say. So I think it's, uh, this is the reason why I think Europe has been trying so much more to be more nuanced about this mm. and saying yes okay we have been naive and yes you were right in you know in calling us off and and, and and pointing out that we have to better protect ourselves and protect our norms and values with higher barriers of different kinds you know including investment screening or or trade defense instrument and we've done our homework there but let's not call this decoupling because that's not in anybody's interest mm. also not not even in, in the interest of the people that you were just talking about that don't know the benefits of globalization but actually have been experienced it. So I think that's a very important point to make, to talk about, you know, limited and targeted decoupling, because that's what it is, and I think that's what we should be doing. 
Um, so at the same time, we want to maintain that, you know, interoperability and partnerships was the title of the previous panel. Well, I think this applies to this as well, right? With specific countries in particular, we want to maintain that interoperability. And Indo-Pacific region is a very important region uh, for the United States and for Europe because it is a growing market. This is where the growing middle class is, but also because it's a group of countries that does not want to be, you know, sort of left alone with China and, and, and you know, as a, as a big influence in the region. They, they will always be connected to China, so let's not try and, and, and pull them away, uh, pretend that this is possible, uh, but let's offer them also an alternative. Mm -hmm. And I think that is exactly what the, the EU has been doing. Again, global gateway and connectivity, and there's many downsides to that also, but at least it's something that the EU has been investing in over the years. And I'm very curious next week in, uh, you know, Biden, uh, President Biden's now on his way to Japan, I believe, for that summit where we will hear the announcement of that Indo-Pacific economic framework. Well, what is that really about, right? Um, we will have to find out, obviously, uh, but I'm very curious. And I think the, the United States has to do a little bit more, you know, a little bit less talk of decoupling and a little more of showing that on different terms, you know, we, we will be always be connected and we can help help you with, you know, less dependence or, you know, safer uh, and more resilient uh, connection. Yeah, we're all waiting to see what comes out in this Indo-Pacific economic framework. I, I think it's going to be a lot of BS myself, but with all due respect, because yeah. we, we had TPP, right? So we had the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which we walked away from, which many people looked at was less of an economic deal than a strategic deal, and walking away from it left the region vulnerable to the sense that China was the one determining momentum and growth, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the Biden and administration has been trying to act like it still has economic weight and economic consequence, you know, for the futures of these countries without calling them trade deals. Mm -hmm. And that's why, why it's going to be interesting. But somebody might want to challenge my perspective on that in the audience when we get to questions. I do want to, um, uh, I want to get to Ileana, but I want to tell people we will take questions. And I know virtually, somehow, those of you watching online can send questions in to this little tablet. So feel free, keep sending questions in. We'll get to them as well. But Ileana, your thoughts? Yes, so four very quick comments. Uh, first, on, on decoupling, I, I totally agree with Mike in the sense that 80% of global exchanges of all kinds happen between or within Europe, North America, and Asia Pacific. And uh, it was like that 10 years ago, it is like that now, and uh, it will probably keep on going like that for, for a few years um, from now. And. Um, and as for, for, for the potential decoupling of, of the U.S., well, according to this index, to the, the, the Global Presence Index, the U.S. is the country with the highest global presence of 150 countries. And it has kept on growing for the last, during the Obama administration, during the Trump administration, and the global presence of China is three times lower. Of course, the gap is narrowing. That's interesting. But, uh, so in what characteristics is it lower? Like, to explain what's low, what, what do we do bigger, what do they do lower? Because I, I want to know, because I've never heard that. And that was my second point in everything. Mm. The countries that, that have the highest global, the higher global presence are those countries that have a diversified global presence. And this takes me back to, to, to the comment on, on diversification versus concentration and, speci and specialization. And the cost that goes with, with uh, transiting from, transitioning from the, the just in time to just in case economic philosophy. Of course, it's costly, but uh, uh, it's not necessarily uh, a bad strategy from the efficiency and the economic point of view. And uh, Chinese, US, German economies are highly diversified compared to the rest of the economies in the world, and they are performing pretty well compared to the rest of the economies in the world. Um, and as for, for, for the energy and ef efficiency growth, uh, well, yes, maybe we cannot expect energy to, to, to the use of energy to drop in, in, in a new growth pattern or growth model, but um, well, digitalization has mm -hmm. also to do with that. I mean, we should be able to, to consume less and less energy to produce more or less the same amount of things. And finally, fourth and last comment on your question on, on, on the middle class. Well, um, that's, what, that's one of the Chinese weaknesses, actually. Uh, they don't have, because of, of the type of economic model and, 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 and growth pattern that they chose, uh, they don't have an expanding middle class. A little bit more so since the Great Recession and when they acknowledge the, the, the high dependency. You don't, you don't think China has an expanding middle class? No, 
a little, I mean, yes. The I sort of think they do. It is, it is growing a little bit compared to what was happening during the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, but it's not the foundation of their economic model. Mm. And also, they are aging. <laughs> Two, like Europeans, like Latin Americans, like everyone else, except for, for, for Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, I'm not sure to what extent China is going to take the lead on that particular domain. And also, an expanding middle class, of course, would be a challenge to the political regime. Yeah. I know Clemens and Rafael want to jump in. I, I, I sort of I become um, a big fan of Alibaba. Did anybody get on Alibaba's website? It's like the Chinese version of Amazon, but better. You know, they've got influencers and little shows. And, and you know, Alibaba is selling about $65 billion a year of U.S. goods, I'm sure European goods too, into Chinese consumers that are buying this stuff. And I think, well, I wish I had someone from China on this panel because I'd ask them and say, what are your views of globalization? Are you, are you going to be, you know, you, you buy all bird shoes and Fender guitars and Johnson and Johnson baby powder now. And, and is that changing the way they're looking at their role and place in the world in a positive way or not? I think it'd be an interesting question to ask. But Clemens, I know you want to re uh, react. Yes, uh, two short points. The, the first about China. We shouldn't underestimate China, but we shouldn't overestimate it either. I totally agree. China has an aging problem and chi China has another economic problem, which is called overinvestment. Currently, the Chinese economy is investing 40% of GDP, of its GDP, and it's growing at five. Mm. This is absolutely unsustainable. So if you invest that much, you either grow much more quickly or uh, you are accumulating more and more inefficient capital. So right. capital that's producing nothing. So I think we, you know, inevitably, uh, some sort of structural change to has burst. to come. Yeah. And that, that adjustment will be very difficult for China, but it cannot continue the way it does now. So I think more likely than a stellar ascent of China is problems, and these problems right. will also mean problems for the West. And on decoupling, what, you know, I've, I, I, find, I, I also agree to these comments. So we, I mean, we, I don't think we are moving towards a world, as you described with, you know, China leading one sphere, and the US leading the other, but maybe it's a world where we do have two spheres, but they go across countries. The one sphere is the sphere of economic exchange, a trade, so here we are cooperating, and then there is the sphere of military and geopolitical power, and there we are competing. And I think the interesting question is, you know, will these spheres coexist, and we, will we be able to maintain this kind of peaceful coexistence, or will the a geopolitical spillover uh, into the economic and into the trade. And now one gets the impression, yes, it does, with the debate about energy embargoes, uh, the seizure of assets of the central banks. But, it, but it, I mean, you sent me a note and Rafael sent me a note, <coughs> if I may share with uh, the audience what you shared, that, that in a way, I don't think that works out very well because you talked about the weaponization of economies. Right. You talked about the weaponization essentially of what used to be public goods that came from global connectivity. And when you basically put up walls and you weaponize that, right, and people get fear, they, that's where you get vaccine nationalism, right? You get the, the fear that that global system won't work, so you seize up, um, or you weaponize energy, or you weaponize economic impact, or as we're gonna discuss later today in technology, you know, I'm really interested in the fact if, if, if America and Europe have a high degree of embedding um, ethics into the application of AI and facial recognition, but Chinese companies don't have that. Which grows better and faster? Which is more innovative? My hunch is that China is going to outrun Europe and the US that are appropriately concerned about ethical concerns, and it raises an interesting question of then the weaponization of tech. And um, uh, Rafael, you sent me a note saying, we, we Polish, have no illusions, had no illusions about China and Russia like like our other Western partners and Americans did. So just respond real quickly, if you would, to the illusions you think are still out there, because I think you you think we're going to end up in a more divided world. Sure. Just quick points returning to what Iliana said. She said what economists believe, and this is kind of obvious, uh, just to understand correctly. Uh, most democratic countries, the, the growth in most democratic countries is, con is uh, based on the domestic consumption, private consumption. It's from 40 to 60% of GDP, and it builds middle class. 
because they actually it brings fruits of growth to those uh, middle class which is growing and is stabilizing political system. In countries like Russia and China, uh, the, the economic pattern is based on exports. And the fruits of exports goes to the very narrow class, elites, oligarchs. You can call them oligarchs in China in terms of the capitalists or oligarchs that are actually formed from the KGB How in Russia. How did you avoid Poland just, having just, oligarchs? Just a, just a quick, uh, ex uh, actually I was going into or that. do you uh, have oligarchs and we don't know them? No, we don't in Poland for the simple reasons. Uh, actually, first of all, we don't have energy resources which is a blessing uh, to some extent. China uh, has to less extent, but they have a massive export surplus. So, so they, they actually building this oligarchic class on, on export profits. Russia, of course, to a small extent, Ukraine, uh, build the oligarchic class to, that captured uh, state-owned assets. Right. And uh, just a, an example, uh, well-known oligarch, um, famous in, in, in London, uh, that is now worth around uh, 14 billion, uh, before the, let's say, capture of some assets, but worth 14 billion uh, dollars. Majority of that comes from the one single transaction of reselling Sibneft uh, oil company in 2005 to Gazprom. So I bet that uh, half of this uh, audience would perform better in financial terms if they get $14.2 billion in 2005, getting $14 billion in 2020. And that's, that's the methods, uh, those people managing also their assets. They are buying yachts, uh, they are buying uh, jets, but they are not investing uh, in, in, in the, and developing uh, uh, they, 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 uh, enterprises or, or the economy. But, but, and back this is the the issue, but back to the issue and, and about this is the China. Reason, this is the reason that in Central European we don't have that problem. In China and Russia, and actually that should be the question to our panel. It's not about the globalization, it's about the simple question, what will happen to Russia and China? Because there are two big game changers. And if we put some focus uh, both to Russia and China, which basically are still to some extent communist countries, and why Poles had very skeptic about that, because we trained the communist system mm -hmm. uh, for the last 50 years, and the results are none. So that is why the system is only getting more and more aggressive when it's collapsing. And it was happening in, Ch in Poland in, in the 80s. It is happening now, nowadays in Russia. So if you ask the question, what will happen to Russia and then to China, we'll probably get the answer, what will happen with globalization or decoupling. Fascinating. I'd like to move to questions from the audience uh, soon. So um, there's a big light in my um, eyes. So I don't, let's see. Do we have questions out there? I guess yes, in the very back, right back here. Yes, sir. <coughs> and tell us Me who you are. Melchior Szczepanik, uh, Polish Institute of International Affairs. The, the European Union, if, if, we, if we analyze the discussions that are going on, are not, is not only trying to make its economy, its economy more resilient, but also more sustainable in terms of using less resources, using them more effectively, making economic activity less harmful for, for the climate, for environment, also making some progress on labor rights. I would like to ask the panelists how do they, how do, do they see s prospects for progress on this front? It's a great, great question. Micah, would you want to jump at that real quick? And I guess Europe becoming, and we, we call it the ESG movement. Europe is trying to become better on um, environment, social governance, uh, these kinds of questions and move forward. And we were having a debate last night at the nightcap. I have to remember the parts of that were off the record. But, um, but essentially that some countries in their efforts to be greener are creating strategic liabilities for their partners. So if you get rid of a bunch of nuclear power plants in a country, you're presuming that others are going to backstop your energy if you need it. So I'm just interested in that because part of that question is as Europe tries to become more green and do this and where we have a crisis going on with Europe, what's the responsible way forward that you're not creating strategic liabilities while you're at the same time trying to respond to the climate? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think it must have been more than 10 years ago that I wrote about Japan's green economic diplomacy. And I started with what's actually green, because to the Japanese, actually, nuclear power plants were greening. Yeah. Um, and obviously, this was at a time when in Europe, you know, we were at the total opposite end of, uh, of, of thinking on the, in that regard. Um, now, Europe is changing, so that's really interesting. But we also see in the news now that Europe has to open up to new coal plants again. So I think this is a very humbling time for Europe where you know many of the things that we were, have been asking of other countries to do we are now sort of also having to do ourselves because we realize that otherwise you know we will create with with all too green comes also new new liability new dependencies or at least it's not a way of solving the dependencies that we had so i think that that as a as a general remark i would like to also put into the debate you know what is green really to us how do we define that um, is i think an, an important one um, because for example also uh, you know this this push for the EU for, for sustainable uh, connectivity, again, not globalization, sustainable connectivity, uh, is about, you know, sustainable in the, the, the commercially sustainable way that you, you build projects when they're actually needed and not when you wish to build a, a bridge or a road yourself somewhere. Also financially sustainable so that, you know, you won't leave countries with that. But it's also about en environmentally sustainable. A and what is that exactly? I think we are only now trying to find out what that is but but here I would like to you know link again to to technology because again technology I think is is a really interesting push for you know new opportunities that, that where we can get to solutions that are really essential to to maximize that sustainable economic development uh, and and go through that green energy transition uh, and how do we make best use of that uh, and who gets to innovate uh, and where do we share the knowledge of that I think you know if we're talking about transatlantic partnership and, and cooperation also here we need to do way more to do that because digital technologies they, they, they can help you know facilitate um, that 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 green transition um, but there's also you know as as you mentioned uh, you know the, the the risk with technology that could lead also to you know killer robots uh, some people have called it I don't believe we're anywhere close to that so that's sort of a, a misgiving but anyway it's it's a risk also comes with risks that I know one of your colleagues as PISM actually she told me yesterday is also looking into what are the risks uh, here of technology and, and and human rights effect so sharing you know information about about that and learning from other regions what are their definitions of green and how they have been dealing with this is I think in this phase uh, a really important one um, because clearly I mean there's so many more uh, so many opportunities uh, but where exactly I think we really are right. only at the very right. beginning of finding that out and I think everybody's jumped in we have Clemens and then Ileana uh, yes I, I mean regarding sustainability I think there are really two approaches in Europe about where we're going. The one is uh, have a more market-based approach. If we think about climate change, there is the European emissions pricing system, um, which is a very uh, good and efficient instrument. It doesn't tell companies or people where exactly to bring down CO2 emissions, but if you uh, emit CO2, you pay for it. Uh, that's a very dynamic system, and, and it's a good system. It, it doesn't cover all sectors, but it should. But then there's also the other tendency in Europe, which is let's organize sustainability uh, in the, I always say, Soviet Union way, in the centrally planned way. And mm -hmm. uh, we have already started as the taxonomy. Uh, we are creating a taxonomy that's uh, for, for finance in that case, for sustainable finance. It's a list, you know, what, what people are doing here. I, I don't think that's always understood everywhere in Europe. So we are setting up a list of every economic activity. It's a list, you know, it has a lot of pages. Mm -hmm. And we are classifying each of the, these activities as either sustainable or unsustainable. And if you look at what banks are doing at the moment, they are have a strong tendency to finance only activities on that list. So how do you get on that list? Uh, it's an administrative process and uh, you can do lobbying. So you know, a lot of companies and sectors do a lot of lobbying. Uh, to so get it's a totally out. central central total central planning approach. It's complete madness. It totally undermines perspectives for economic growth in Europe. But we are more and more moving towards this central planning approach. And unfortunately, many politicians, European politicians, really love it. Mm. Because if you have all these, sec these lists, you know, you can then apply instruments to them and really steer the economy. So I think Europe uh, is really at, at the crossroads here. Either we are getting rid 
of this taxonomy and indeed we've only started with the environmental so all these hundreds of pages doing that for climate protection it, you know is it takes a very long time but it, this is called esg right so we have the social we have the governance mm -hmm. and writing up more lists would be total madness and a lot of people or more and more people understand this now and i really hope we are stopping but um i mean there is i i'm afraid there is a concept of what sustainability is and this is this taxonomy this list for instance defense wasn't on it now we've realized oh, the world has changed, so we need to change our central planning approach. Central planned economies aren't very good at adjusting to changes. Uh, so uh, I really think the f a lot of the future of Europe depends on whether we can get rid of this central planning approach. And thank you. Eliana. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I agree on, 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 th on that. Um, um, feel, what feel free to take a whack at him. <laughs> okay. No, no, the thing is that um, I was thinking, what, what does it take to, to make this transition in Europe? And I, I, I would have said, well, first of all, change of narrative on, on what the economy is supposed to do and uh, what means to be greener and uh, sustainable. And uh, I think this taxonomy is part of that. I understand the risks with uh, uh, centralizing this type of decisions, but I really don't see how else we are going to make such a great change. Uh, the market per se uh, was not doing that transition. So, I mean, how, how, could, we, how could we do that? I mean, um, without the proper incentives, I don't see that happening. The thing, the, the, the challenge in Europe, and, and, and I would like to underline that to me, this is a feature of the European Union, not a flaw, um, is that, of course, the way of taking decisions is much more complex than in the US or in China, because uh, these are individual decisions by right now 70 members but we were 28, uh, sorry, 27 members, but we were 28 just a few years ago. We might become 28 again soon. So this is a very difficult institutional and political process, but it's also true that once these decisions are made and taken, uh, usually they are sustainable and, and resilient in time for the good and for the bad. Mm. Uh, Rafa. Just quickly, uh, two examples. Uh, AML regulations, anti-money laundering regulation, and uh, ESG. Uh, actually, I spent last four years in a rather top position in the banking sector in Poland. So in, in terms of uh, money laundering, actually, it's quite visible how massive it was in Europe, in term, irrespective of regulations. I'm thinking about Russian money, official or dirty money. So we have a very tight AML regulations, and somehow they uh, doesn't work. Surprise. Uh, secondly, we of course now discuss all this tax taxonomy, regulations, how are actually most of my time in the banking sector, irrespective that I was in charge of the one of the business segments in the bank, was discussing about regulations. Mm. And I can tell you that there is a massive greenwashing uh, in the financial sector, uh, because banks, the financial sector are very creative. Uh, and of course, again, in Poland, there's a little bit different thinking because we don't have a, a Russian money in Poland. So EML uh, regulation holds. One of the reasons of that, that is that we don't have Russian banks in Poland. They were not allowed to, never, ever. Uh, for the reasons. Uh, in terms of the ESG regulation and environmental regulations, the very, there is a very simple concept that is uh, widely known, discussed, that we should have a proper taxonomy in terms of uh, so-called scope uh, two uh, uh, data, analyzing uses and sources of energy. Uh, basically, uh, the concept is simple, but nevertheless, uh, industry, the banking sector is massively against that because that would require to capture or to measure properly what are the sources of energy. Uh, and of course, if you, if you um, greenwash uh, uh, the whole concept, uh, for the reasons, again, that the, there is a political reasons uh, uh, in Europe for that, you don't, have, don't, you don't have results that you expect. And that's what I was saying about the causes and consequences. So the problem is that I, we are not serious about implementing regulations, that the idea might be good, but the for performance is even worse. Uh, so if you want to change something, especially in terms of the climate and environment, we should develop, uh, uh, we should develop instruments that are economically reliable and that are I mean the industry is able to implement 
uh, and not trying to greenwash, uh, hiding results. The, I don't know if you follow the last comparison of the uh, CO2 uh, print of the diesel engines versus electric engines. Surprise, diesel engines are more or less a CO2 uh, footprint than electric engines. If you combine all the elements for producing cars uh, uh, in, in, in the old fashion uh, and the new fashion, when you have a rare earth metals, which uh, extraction is very right. costly and, and not very environmental friendly. And right. that's, I'm not saying that electric cars are wrong, but I'm saying about uh, collecting data properly, measuring effects, and building policies that are reliable, because then the effects cannot be that this kind of a tax is levied on the companies or the, or the consumers or on some countries, while the other countries right. are only profiting from that. So this is, I think, kind of a business approach. Thank you. We have another uh, question out here right in the back and then one in the middle. Damien. That is Damien, right? Okay. Thank you very much. Patrick Kugel, I am analyst at PISM. Uh, First of all, I would like to say I'm glad you already brought the question, key question of weaponization of interdependence, weaponization of everything, actually. Right. So I would like to hear more from the panel. How do you see uh, how to de, de weaponize uh, globalization without the deglobalization? But actually, my, my question is uh, more specific on, on another issue. I would like to uh, reflect on possibly the major impact outcome of the COVID pandemic is increasing debts in developing countries. Uh, and uh, there are more than 60 countries already which are hit by uh, debt crisis and food uh, prices, uh, uh, crisis and energy prices, uh, crisis. So, and we had just seen yesterday in Sri Lanka, which defaulted on its debt, that this is really serious problem that can lead to uh, political upheaval and, and, and riots and right. everything. So the question is, uh, can West do uh, some serious decisions, make some serious decisions on uh, debt cancellation or suspension of payments, like how to deal, how to help the global South countries to deal with this indebtedness uh, to uh, to avoid some major uh, thank, thank problems you. in the future. It's a terrific question, and <clears throat> I, and I think it's something that doesn't get nearly enough discussion. That that there's just the developing world has become a victim essentially of a lot of the things we're talking about today. You know, even if we were to go through some you know modification of you know, global trading system, global investment system, it ends up with the developing world, you know, getting the short stick again. But thoughts on, there were the two questions there. One was, how do, you know, is there any way to de-weaponize um, economic activity? And I don't know if there is, because I think that's one of the problems of, of moving from a high trust global economy to a higher fear um, system where there's that, and it's just going to increase, you know, you know, generally result in lower quality of life all around on both all sides of the equation. But so I'd love any response on that. But on the other broader side about developing nations debt and responding, you know, to the outcomes of things like the debt crisis and the global supply chain crisis. Clemens, you look like you're ready to respond. Yeah, I'll, I'll ha be happy to try. Now, on, on weaponization of interdependence, I think there are two forms uh, of weaponization. The first is think very critically and, and deal systematically with uh, dependencies. So the EU depends on Russian gas, but that is a mutual dependence. So 70% of Russian gas uh, goes to the EU. So this is a form of mutual dependence. I think, uh, to make things short, the future is uh, countries will need to look very closely at one-sided dependencies. I, I think it would be wrong, and that's why this question is so important, for the EU to stop imports of Russian gas. I mean, my country, people, uh, a lot of people think that's the solution. We stop importing Russian gas. I think this would be strategically stupid because what we want is the EU not depending on Russian gas, but Russia continuing to depend on the EU because otherwise they, they would sell their ga gas elsewhere. So what we need to do is build up parallel structures and continue importing gas after the war, of course. Now, now is a different question, but, but after, after the war. So, so, so think strategically in a systematic way. What we currently do is often think 
about single issues like semiconductor production, we need to do this more, sis more systematically. I think that would, would be the approach needed. I mean, the other form of weaponization is to really think, okay, if, if China is better off, we are worse off. I think that's sometimes the US approach, and that would really mean reduce trade, right. uh, bring down trade. I think that would be a more extreme form. Does anybody want to respond on the debt issue, uh, Ileana? Just quick answer, growth. I mean, this is the only answer that you have from economic uh, practice. So if you don't have a growth, you actually fail on that. You are bankrupt. If you, so the issue is to have growth. Uh, the for example, Italy, because this is the well-known case, when you have indebtedness at the level of 150, 160 percent of GDP and growth dynamic uh, around zero one, there is no way to, to, to avoid uh, debt problems. The developing countries usually made lots of mistakes in economic developments, and still they increased debt because interest rates were low. And it happens with interest rates, and sometimes they But I they also think, just to intervene there for a minute, that part of the question was about the impact of COVID, and these countries didn't have the resources. For, so I, I just think it's another dimension. When you have an exogenous shock come along and make everything worse, you know, what's the responsibility of those with resources? But Ileana? Yes, and to the list of risk that, that Patrick just mentioned, um, we, we should just add inflation. So uh, probably growth rates are going to be literally eaten by inflation. So I really don't see, of course, I see a debt crisis coming. I see a food crisis coming. I mean, we all see debt and food crisis coming. And I don't see how uh, massive debt can cancellations are going to be avoided. Um, and, and just a quick, quick word on, on de-weaponization. Um, I think, I think that sometimes it happens like with decoupling. Uh, to what extent uh, conflict and cooperation were not always part of global, inter um, of, of global relations. Right. So, uh, of course, now we are in, a, in the middle of a war, of, uh, also of a trade war between U.S. and China. But uh, I think to some extent these sorts of tensions were, were always there right, in different right. forms. Well, Mike, if I can, let me take Damien's question and have you answer that, and then we'll do a quick round. Damien? Thank you. Uh, Daniel Znikowski, Polish Institute of International Affairs. Thank you for a very interesting and uh, inspiring discussion. And I would like to get back to the Russian and um, Chinese cooperation and what Mr. Antchak uh, mentioned about their future will, to some extent, shape also the future of globalization. So the first uh, part of the question, how, what role do you see for Russia in the, in the future uh, globalized world or in this changing globalized world, let's, uh, I understand and I uh, agree that the globalization will not disappear, but it will change, it will evolve, and what kind of role Russia can play in this, uh, in this uh, world when we see that the West is cutting uh, much of those ties? And the second part of the question, let's assume that Russia will be more reliant on China in the future because of the war and because of the, this decoupling or cutting ties with the West. So what does yeah. it mean Thank for you. EU, for the US, for the West? Thank Mike, I'm going to start with you on that, but I'm also going to reflect for the fact that at the beginning of this crisis, as you saw, the world cut Russia off on so many levels. If you look at the Russian stock market now, you look at the Russian ruble, it's pretty pretty amazing how the bounce back has happened and, and how, I mean, Rafa is going to you know, tell me I'm wrong, but um, I have data coming in, I'm looking, I'm pretty surprised at how quickly, at least for this near term, Russia has shrugged off some of the steps that the world has taken to cut it off. But your thoughts? Yeah, well, uh, disclaimer, I'm, I'm not a Russia expert, so mm. that's uh, <laughs> important to note here. Um, but uh, indeed, the dependence of Russia, the growing dependence that will, uh, you know, is, uh, has been uh, coming in, uh, in, in already, and it will, you know, grow even more, I think, on China. That, that is, I think, not good for Europe. Uh, because it will, you know, give China another opportunity to to influence us in uh, via Russia, perhaps. So, what, wha how, how to deal with this? I, I agree with uh, Clemens when he says this. You know, this is also when we look at the weaponization uh, of trade. We want to think about mutual dependencies and not cutting off all dependencies. Um, but when they're mutual, you know, actually keep some of that, you know, for our own benefit. And, and I think this is also plays in to, um, to here. So yes, definitely we're going to have to rethink. Right. Uh, we are rethinking our relationship with Russia on, on energy is, is one thing. Uh, but let's not cut off all ties. It will always be our neighbor. Um, and we have to, you know, have some links right. there. Right. Rafael? 
Uh, very quickly, <coughs> a ruble market is tightly regulated, so exchange rate doesn't show nothing. Uh, secondly, historically, talk, thinking about uh, Russia, dissolution of the or collapse of the Soviet Union was a blessing for Central European countries. So maybe it's necessary to happen the same with Russia. Uh, thirdly, I mean, and that relates to China, you usually in, the, in a managerial approach uh, in a comprehensive uh, problem solve it piece by piece. So I don't believe in some global uh, solutions. Uh, the process actually requires to solve problem by problem. So nowadays problem, uh, global problem is not only Central European problem, is Russia. Thank you. Ileana, quick final thought? Clemens, quick finally, final thought? Maybe just one word on the debt. I think it's a serious problem. The key issue here is who owns it. Uh, we have more than, more than before, we have flexible exchange rate regimes now, which gives countries more of a leeway, but will probably lead to more inflation. And then uh, if the creditors are domestic savers, that's the case of Italy, it's not a developing country, but uh, it's very hard to cancel the debt because uh, you know, if you cancel the debt, this, a lot of your savers lose money and that leads to political upheaval. So that's really tricky. I'm afraid a lot of that will be wiped out by more unstable currencies. You know, I would just say in conclusion to Damien's question about the China side of it, that you know, China's a really interesting country. I've spent a lot of time there and talked. They, they kind of want a status quo world. Everybody stay within their lines. Everybody, you know, keep everything kind of calm just as they get incrementally more powerful. And, and so I think that's sort of the world they want. And 